Now, the retired Ukrainian tennis player Sergei Stakovsky has returned to his home country to fight against the Russian invasion. He's left behind his wife and children in Hungary, and he's joined the army reservists in Kiev, and that's where he joins us now. Um, Sergei uh, Stakovsky, thank you very much for your time with us on Breakfast this morning. Um, what stage are you at now? You've, you've decided to stay there. Well, I didn't decide to stay. I decided to come back. That's a bit different. Uh, yes, but we are safe. Now we're in Kiev. Uh, we just hear about six or seven times a day the airstrike alarm. So we go down to basement. But rather than that, there's no gunfights inside Kiev. There's no Russian troops inside the premises of Kiev. And uh, I very much hope it's going to stay that way. I see you are in, uh, I see part of you from the uh, shoulders up. And I'm assuming you're in your uniform at this moment in time. Yeah, well, there's no such thing as uniforms uh, these days. It's just everybody's bringing their own gear, whatever they had. I have this, uh, some sort of gear since 2015 or 14 when we, uh, when there was annexation of Crimea and then from 15 uh, or 14 onwards when I was uh, donating a lot of uh, military stuff to the army. Uh, some of it left in my house, so I'm using it now. Um, what have you been asked to do when you said you would go back and you would fight? What have you been asked to do? Um, uh, you just join the reserves. We're the last line. I mean, they're not going to, you know, we, we only are allowed to be used in the, in the terms of the city. We are the territorial defense. So we cannot leave the city of Kiev. Uh, we are here in support of the um, Ukraine armed forces. But basically what we do is just we have some checkpoints. We, we stand on uh, controlling the cars in terms of that the Ukrainians are passing through. Um, delivering stuff, um, communication. This, this, we don't do real serious stuff, thank God, uh, because I think for that is the army are more responsible. When you say the serious stuff, have you been given any indication, because you will be aware of the reports, um, as we've been reporting here in the UK, of tanks making their way, a convoy making um, its way to Kiev. Have you been told that you would be expected to do the serious stuff, as you say, um, hold a gun? Use a gun. Well, everybody's here with that, with that thought and understanding that this is the future, most likely. Nobody's, uh, you know, telling you, oh, nothing's going to be okay. Everybody's understanding the situation we're in. Now. Everybody understand that very soon the, the, the path of Kharkov, the shelling, which began uh, two days ago and is continuously going on, is going to happen in Kiev as well. Um, you've left your wife and your um, child as well, um, your children, in Hungary. What have you told them? What have you told your children? Um, I didn't say nothing to my children. I was trying to be <clears throat> as brief as I can. They were watching cartoons and, and reading when I was leaving, so I was not trying to distract it. Um, the hardest part was the little one. Because when he saw me leaving uh, at the door, I didn't take any gear with me, just a backpack. And he asked where I'm going. I said, I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, because he really is um, outside. We're really close with him. He likes to spend time with me. Now we then knew that if I'm going to say, that I'm, you know, I'm going somewhere, he's going to start crying and say, no, 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 he's come back. So when I just saw him, I'll, I'll be right back. Um, I just hope that I will be right back. How old is he? Three. So, uh, this, how long have you been away from home? Uh, what the date is today? Wednesday? It's, it's, when, it's Thursday today, 3rd Wednesday, of March. So five. Five. I mean, it, this is heartbreaking. And I, I, I wonder what conversations you are able to have with your wife and what she is able to tell your children. Well, she's, of course, she was upset and she was mad. Uh, we talk now, which is an improvement. I just hope that one day she will forgive me for what I've done. Although I'm not sure I will forgive myself, but it was a no-win scenario for me. If I would stay, I wouldn't forgive myself, and, and now I cannot forgive myself even when I'm here. That conversation must have been um, very, very difficult to have with your wife and for, for you to choose. Do you think you've made well, a choice she... between your family and your country? Yes, that's how it looks like, unfortunately. Uh, do you have people around you who've made similar decisions? Yes, by choice and not by choice, but predominantly by choice. What do you 
What do you say when your wife asks you, what is happening? When will I see you again? I say that it's safe. I say, but actually it is safe because, you know, when the rocket strikes somewhere, we cannot know that it's going to strike your house or your building. So you are safe until that time because there's no shooting on the street. So there's no real open threat unless the airstrike comes. And when I'm going to be back, I'm... Oh, apologies. We lost that. I mean, you can understand uh, the technology trying to establish a secure line there. I was talking to Sergei, who is still there. Let's let me just... I want to continue talking to Sergei. It's Sergei Stakovsky, who is um, Ukrainian. He has gone back to Ukraine from Hungary. He's left his wife and his children. And he's gone to fight, and he's in Kiev. Um, Sergei, we lost the line briefly there. Apologies um, for that. Um, no worries. We, we were talking talking to you about the conversation you'd had to have with, with your family and the fact that you'd met other people there who'd made choices, made choices between their families um, in other countries and leaving and defending their country. And you were saying you'd met other people who'd done that. And you were just beginning to talk about what is happening in the coming days. What do you predict will happen, say, for you today? How do you approach just today? Uh, we're just trying to fill our day with, with as many activities as we can, you know, because sitting and waiting is the worst. Because you start to think about all the other things, you start to read news, what happened across Ukraine and the shelling and the bombing and the deaths of civilians, and that's not going to raise your spirits up, it just brings anger. Um, we hope that it will eventually end. Uh, we know that Russia doesn't want to lose, so it will not end well, most likely, but we are prepared for it. You know, one thing that um, media outlets and across the world and Russia has been surprised about is the spirit of the Ukrainian people and, and the resistance. Um, t talk to me about the people you speak to who are not in your position, who are civilians on the streets, who are still in Kyiv. Well, I will not tell you about the people in Kyiv. I'll tell you about the people around Ukraine because I've made my path on foot across the border from Slovakia to Ukraine. And then we drove all that distance and every single city, village, or even the, from the main road, when you turn to the village, uh, the people, they're, they're grouping up, they're teaming up, they bring their hunting guns, they create um, barricades on the road, they create checkpoints, and the spirits are very high. I mean, when I was <clears throat> not in Ukraine, you know, it was for me, it was very hard because I was trying to get information, where's the shelling, where's the bombing, where are the troops moving, my, my parents were here, now it's only my father and my brother, they stand behind, so they're here with me. <clears throat> so it was tougher, but when, when I came, when I crossed the border, crossing the border was also tough because I understood that that's, that's the point of no return. But then when I saw all these people, all their spirit, all their enthusiasm and will not to surrender, not to let anybody from, you know, from the Russia or the agents of Russia or the, how you, I don't know how you call them, this uh, disturbed groups uh, to pass, uh, well, I mean, my spirits also raised up. And then on top of that, we have a president who is leading by example, which is, I think, in our case, is the most important part. We have a person who willing to go the distance he's he understands and accepts his risks but he stayed in kiev and he stayed with his people and we've heard <clears> obviously <throat> today uh, the news that it's been confirmed from ukraine uh, as, as well as uh, claimed by russia that um Kherson, um a major ukrainian city has fallen into russian hands has that how quickly is that is news like that coming to you and what is the impact of that emotionally um for when people in Ukraine or Kiev, where you are, hear that? Well, Kherson is a, <clears throat> is a strategic city. Of course, we knew about it. We knew about that there, there was a lot of troops underneath and a lot of uh, military um, you know, tanks and, and armored vehicles. But, you know, we don't take it for granted. Uh, you know, you know the news that uh, Kherson had been taken, but yesterday Gorlovka was taken back first time since 2014. Um, and I'm... I, I have full confidence in Ukraine armed forces that the Harrison will be taken back soon, back. When will you next speak to your family? Uh, hopefully today. Um, Sergei Sakovsky, I hope that conversation does bring you some light um, in very, very dark times. Um, and I know this is a struggle for you and you've made a, a, a heartbreaking decision and 
one that not everyone will, will understand, but everyone will certainly appreciate. And I, I wish you peace. That's what I, I wish you peace. Sergei Stokowski um, talking to us from Kiev.